Hey folks, let's learn something new about the oil and gas industry. All right, here's our monthly show where we have Rod McKenzie with uh, Rustman Info on. How you doing today, Rod? I'm good, Mark. I'm good. It's minus 28 outside. The snow is thick on the ground, but I'm warm and snug in my apartment. And it looks like you got a new camera. Yeah, I've got a new <laughs> XD camera. Just thought you'd like to see more of me. <laughs> it actually, the picture looks really good. Um, so, you know, thanks for uh, trudging through the snowfall to get the HD camera so our audience can see you better. Correct. Now, Mark, we always start off the show since we basically got talking together uh, over 18 months ago about the oil price. When we were talking back then, it was 33 bucks, and we've been talking it to 50, and sometimes it's been that, but it looks like at the end of this year it's we're going to be well over 50 it's 54 uh for brent and 51 for wex testers yeah and so we're right in the sweet spot that you and i talked about i you know we still think that we're going to stay between that 50 and 60 dollar range depending on what goes on geopolitically um, but but there's in the last month there's been a lot of stuff speaking of oil and gas and geopolitically that has changed you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, I mean, uh, Russia has not been part of OPEC ever, and it's never really cooperated. But over the last few months, where various countries have been suffering economic problems with their low oil price, uh, Russia took the lead with Vladimir Putin and Alexander Novak, who's the energy minister. And they actually rallied 11 countries that were not part of OPEC. They actually convinced them that uh, less is more. Right. I mean, Russia this year increased its daily output from uh, 10.8 to 11.3 uh, million barrels a day. And it's agreed to cut 300,000. So it's effectively cutting 3% of its output, but it actually increased its output by 5% this year. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that? When those announcements are made, you watch the market um, respond to it immediately, even though the reality was it didn't actually affect supply yet. And it just shows you how much perception plays a part in the price of crude. You're absolutely right. I mean, as soon as the announcement was made last Saturday, uh, it shot up 6%. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, you know, when people try to look at this and forecast, because we do it as well, um, it's not just the supply and demand. There's a bunch of other factors that you have to figure in, such as market perception. And trying to get a handle on that, it's not an exact science. Oh, I think anybody who attempts to gamble on the oil price is going to be in the poor house sooner than they think. Yeah, you know, the people that are really good at it, they make money, but it's over a long period of time. They, they don't micromanage, like, what the price could be today or tomorrow. It's like this year or next three years, and, that, and that's how they do it, because it, it mitigates some of that risk when you look at it over a bigger piece of time. Right. But that's the basis behind it. It was purely and simply economics. Uh, if you're getting $40 a barrel and you're shipping out 10 million barrels and you cut 10% and the price goes up by 50%, then you're getting more money for producing less. Yeah, and, then, and actually you're also not um, um, spending too much time pumping oil out of your existing reservoirs, right? So you end up making the same amount of money, but your reservoirs will last you longer because you're not doing the low price, high volume type of movement. That's correct. Uh, well, obviously we'll have to see because OPEC, before uh, the deal that uh, Putin put together with 11 non-OPEC countries, I always cheated. Uh, so let's see whether the deal holds. But uh, I think that the basis of the deal is it's in everybody's interests. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's um, we sort of suspect that some of the really struggling OPEC members are going to yeah. have a hard time actually sticking to it, even though they agreed to it. Um, and so the problem with that is if one or two of those guys ramp up production they're not supposed to, everybody else is going to do the same thing and this deal is just going to fall apart. Uh, I, th I think you're actually wrong. You may get one or two rogues uh, attempting to do that, but uh, the major agreement is between the two biggest producers apart from the USA, which is Saudi Arabia and Russia. And Russia, right. And if they actually stick to it, and their volumes are much higher. Obviously, Iraq and Iran were given, well, particularly Iran, was given a level of exemption simply because it's had serious problems and its right. production is nowhere near where it used to be. But again, Russia has a relationship with Iran uh, that the U.S. obviously doesn't. Right and uh, has a level of influence because there are a lot of deals going on in the various sectors, energy sector from nuclear through to gas, uh, LNG, etc., that are taking place. 
Yeah, so a lot of people here in the U.S. don't really understand what that longer term play is there. They have the reservoirs, they have the oil. The problem is the infrastructure has been destroyed. They can't bring that oil to market. Yeah. Because they can't bring that oil to market, a bunch of tribes have the country sliced up into little political fiefdoms and they fight amongst themselves. If the government, if the existing government can somehow get everybody to agree and get that infrastructure built, then the government starts making money, which again turn around and pump back into the population to help the people, which then yeah. remove the strength of the tribes, which then make yeah. eventually down the road the country a better country for everybody, for Western relations and for the people that live there. I think that's correct. I mean, the other bonus for Russia is gas. Uh, the price of gas is pretty much tied to the price of oil. <clears throat> And despite all the protestations of uh, the EU of our energy diversifying uh, away from Russia, Russia has actually increased its uh, export of gas by over 11 percent this year. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Russia supplies Europe basically. I mean, there's there's no if and they can wish all they want, but that's where the gas comes from. Yeah, I mean the pipeline gas. Uh, right. Thirty. Four percent of their gas comes from Russia via various pipelines, Nord Stream, etc. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's a, that's a bonus financially. If the gas price goes up along with the oil price, Russia uh, gets the bonus. Yeah, it's interesting. So we did our predictions for 2017, and one of our predictions is that unconventionals like fracking goes mm -hmm. global, right? And so yeah. um, Russia's been fracking for a while now. But the funny thing is that same geology actually is in Europe, and it's going to be interesting, it's interesting to see if the people buy into the anti-fracking rhetoric and keep it from happening, even though it would benefit them, or will the economics make them see, hey, we can produce our own gas, right? So it's going to be interesting to see what happens politically in Europe with that. Uh, well, I think it's unlikely to happen in Germany, and that's because in Merkel's coalition, uh, who are uh, very anti-Russian, by the way, and uh, firm supporters of sanctions, uh, they make up one third of the coalition. And uh, they are vehemently opposed to practically any form of energy. They oppose nuclear, which is why Germany is shutting down its nuclear plants. They don't like coal and they don't like gas. And yeah, I mean, it doesn't leave you a lot of options when it comes to energy. Well, you and I know the truth, right? So they've it, they've went down this road and the, the price of electricity has risen six times in Germany. And they're actually increased their CO2 emissions because they had to build all these small coal fired plants when the uh, renewables couldn't keep up. And so yep. it's, it's actually, from a <clears throat> factual point of view, the opposite of what they were trying to do. The problem is, once again, we talk about perception. The perception, especially the media in Germany, sh showed their uh, Everwind project as being successful, and it's not been successful. No, I mean, uh, renewables have a place, but they are still uh, not cost effective. Not uh, any without subsidy. Yeah. And what is the point subsidizing when you can get energy much cheaper without subsidy? And cleaner from natural gas. Yeah. Um, renewables have their place in our mix. There's sure. but one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. There's a big difference in energy density needed to run uh, Western and European civilization versus the energy you need to run civilization in like Vietnam, an emerging economy. In Vietnam, yeah. they just need a few watts, right? They need to run a light bulb, a laptop, power, cell phone, and maybe a small refrigerator. Whereas here in the US and Europe, I mean, I'm sitting in a, a 3,500 square foot house, I probably need 15 kilowatts a day just to run the house. And, and it's hard to get that from renewables now in, in, in some type of um, long-term, abundant, cheap manner. Um, but they do play a part in the mix. I am very pro-renewable. Um, I think wind and solar have a great place in our energy mix and the costs have come down so much. Certain parts of renewables here in the US though are very against. We have something called the Renewable Fuel Standard, which mm -hmm. forces us to grow corn and turn it into grain alcohol, but you and I can't drink it, and it's forced to mix with gasoline. It's all done by law. It's all subsidized. That needs to disappear. That's that's a drain on our country that makes no sense. And that ethanol absorbs water out the air, so they can't ship it in pipelines. And if it sits in a storage tank too so long, it's actually bad for your engine. So it's it's parts of our renewable structure need to respond to the free market, and if they can't work in the free market, they just need to disappear. That's correct. Well, let's move on a little because uh, since uh, November the 9th, uh, obviously things have been sort of moving forward, uh, particularly from a Russian perspective. I mean, where about one week ago, uh, a guy turned up in Moscow called Carter Page. Now, he's not a novice to Moscow. He actually worked in Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, uh, in the early part of the 2000s. And he was a Trump advisor. 
on his campaign. He turned up and he met with quite a few business leaders and a few politicians, etc. Just sounding out, you know, the situation here, and he was warmly received because, at the end of the day, Russia wants a good relationship with the USA. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and Americans, I, I talk to people all the time. Our media portrays us as thinking one way. It's not how we believe. We want a good relationship with Russia too. The people of the U.S. It's a mutually beneficial thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And but our media portrays it as something totally different. Um, one of the things uh, that Trump brought out, whether you like the guy or not, is he showed the bias in the U.S. media and, and actually in the global media as well, that they really do try to influence things like elections. Um, yeah. You know, I, I come from a statistical background. Our pollsters all got it wrong. Statistically, half of them should have said Trump would have won and half of them Hillary would have won if the error was not intentional. They all voted, they all said Hillary is going to win, which means the error was intentional, which means they introduced a bias into their findings. And so it's just, you know, we, you and I have talked about this before. You just can't trust the main media anymore to report factually. Absolutely not. And this is why I, I love the opportunity to talk with you uh, about uh, what's happening in the oil and gas industry, and particularly his choice, uh, Trump's choice for Secretary of State, uh, Rex Tillerson. <laughs> it just, literally, everybody in my oil and gas world, we don't know what to do with ourselves. We're so happy. We actually have business leaders from the industry in those political positions, not politicians. And, and we're, yeah. we're all looking so far to 2017. We are too. Particularly as Rex Tillerson has, a, shall we say, a track record here. He's been here for, coming here for the last 20 years, since before he was CEO. Uh, yeah, Exxon let me, have invested. Let me stop you. Some of our listeners may not know who he is. He's actually the CEO of Exxon Mobil. He just resigned. Though. Just resigned, right, yes. Yeah. yeah, so Rex has been coming to Russia and Exxon have invested billions of dollars and employed thousands of people here in Russia and have very successful investments and who are planning to do a number of joint ventures with a leading Russian uh, oil company called Rosneft in the Arctic region. They had provided the technology, Rosneft had the uh, fields, uh, etc. and they were going to do a profit sharing uh, joint venture. Uh, that was stopped by sanctions. Right. Um, to be honest, uh, Mr. Tillerson was not the happiest guy uh, okay. about that particular decision because, as he said, it cost his company a lot of money. Yeah, and so we actually think the sanctions are going to be lifted um, during this administration, and, and they need to be lifted. Um, people that are listening to this may automatically say, oh, well, Rex has a, a bias towards Russia because he has investments in there. What people don't understand is ExxonMobil is a global super major. Anywhere in the world that there's oil reserves that they can recover, they have an interest in. Russia just happens to be some of the largest reserves in the world. So it just makes sense for them to be there. And the fact yeah. that they, they bring their engineers and their technology means it helps the Russian companies get that oil on the ground safer and more efficiently than if they would have tried to do it by itself, which in my mind, that's a win-win for everybody. That's correct. But also, the uh, Chevron, the, uh, sorry, Exxon themselves employ large numbers of Russian people. He has Russian management within Exxon Mobil. Uh, so he's got quality people. He knows the country. He knows the politicians. He knows the business leaders. Right. And he knows he's not uh, going to be pushed around. He's got just as much clout here because of the investment level. So he's actually dealing at an equal level in a way that a political appointee uh, would never have had because he's got the knowledge of these people. He's been doing business with these people, negotiated with these people for the past 20 years. Yeah, so yeah. that's why we see it as a positive. Yeah, and we see it as a positive too for, for, for a bunch of reasons. One is he ran ExxonMobil. You know, at, at their $450 billion a year company, he is yeah. qualified to be Secretary of State better than anybody else. Anybody that can run ExxonMobil understands business, negotiations, different cultures, things like cash repatriation, threats, risk management. And so, once again, he's a business leader that's going to be put in this position. And I feel sorry for all the long-term career politicians in the State Department because he's going to get rid of them, right? He's, he's going to build a team there that's going to get stuff done, and I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, the press portrays uh, Vladimir Putin as some sort of autocrat, but he's actually very good for business. He's actually streamlined business. Russia's gone from 97th to 32nd in ease of doing business in the global world. I think the USA is 27th. Yeah, and we've actually slipped. We used to be much higher ranked, We actually, which is not the direction you, I want my country to be going. I want my country going the other way. 
Correct. Yeah. So in that sense, I, I look forward to, uh, with the Trump administration, Rex Tillerson, uh, etc., to a much more positive outlook on uh, the relationship, and particularly for the oil and gas industry, because I see that being a, a big boost for the U.S. oil and gas industry, because it's going to bring opportunities. It's got lower costs, right? And in this low crude price margin, low crude price market, lowering the cost increases companies' margins so they can hire yep. more people, do more work, even at this low crude price. The other thing that Trump has done is um, he actually appointed Rick Perry, the former governor of Texas, as yep. Secretary of Energy. What a lot yep. of people don't know is Rick Perry grew our wind energy um, output 437%. Plus, he's an oil and gas guy. So once again, the perfect person to have as Secretary of Energy is someone that's done it from a business point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think this is part of the, the thing uh, that uh, Trump has been doing is he's actually draining the swamp of career politicians and bringing in people who actually have knowledge, experience of how to do business and how to improve situations. Yeah, he's um, building an A-team. It's not a political team. It's an A-team yeah. of business leaders. Um, you know, I did four years in the Marine Corps, and I, there's a, a, a Mad Dog Mattis, General Mattis. He's bringing in a yeah. Secretary of Defense. There's nobody on this planet, even at 51 years old and 30 pounds overweight, I'd still follow that general in the battle. There's nobody better to have in that place. Once again, he's a soldier. He's done this before. He knows. He's not a politician. Um, and so, I, you know, I agree with you. Trump is building an A-list team of, of people in Washington, not a political organization. And that can only be positive for the world. Yes. Oh. Because uh, the biggest problem we've had over the years, and we see it in with the EU, we see it with uh, Angela Merkel, these people have never had a proper job. Right? Putin, before uh, he became president, was actually head of inward investment in St. Petersburg. So he was there, and he made a big difference to St. Petersburg. Yeah, I, um, I have a special place uh, for Putin. Um, he's a practitioner of Sambo, and I've yeah. played I've played judo since I was 17 years old. And judo and Sambo are like almost identical. Um, so you know, any world leader that actually gets out on the mat and rolls around with other guys, I like that guy. Well, he actually thinks about his people. Uh, he's not in it for personal enrichment. He's actually has turned Russia uh, over the last 16 years into a much better place. Yeah, which is why his popularity ratings are in the 80s through the roof, no matter what's going on, even when the sanctions first hit and there was a dip in Russia's ability to export things like agricultural products, and it, it really affected the economy for a little while, his, his ratings never didn't waver at all. Well, that's because he goes on television every other day uh, with a press conference, as does Lavrov, uh, as does Novak, and they tell the truth. Right? They don't hide behind uh, sort of platitudes and uh, you know, bullshit basically. They say this is what's happening and this is what the situation is. Yeah, as opposed to the politicians here and in Europe who, who I think intentionally try to build this us versus them mentality so that the people in here in Europe don't think about the real issues. They think about yeah. the other side trying to do stuff they don't like versus like France. And they had the whole Paris Climate Accord. France has one of the highest unemployment rates in the developing world. I think if I was lived in France, I'd be more worried about that than the Paris Climate Accord. You know, but the politicians were able to make that such a big deal that people get caught up in that and not realize what's going on day to day in their country. Yeah, it's, it's all about issues and tackling issues. Yeah. Uh, and Trump's team, uh, which I, we've talked about, uh, I'm very confident that there will be an uptake uh, in, in what's going to be happening. Yeah, I, I think they're going to get work done. It's no longer going to be this, this, this. It's get out of the way, let's get it done, which we've needed for a long time. We haven't had that since Ronald Reagan, which was, what, 82, 84, something like that? Uh, 82 to 1990. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you think the futures could bring uh, in the oil and gas industry in Russia. Well, should the uh, optimism uh, be justified, which you know is looking at reasonable? I mean, the EU have just extended sanctions, but you know what? The EU sanctions against Russia are negligible, to right. be honest. The only thing it means is my wife can't get her favorite French cheese, and I can't get my favorite English mature cheddar. Pretty right. much everything else, as you've seen, from malt whiskey to fine wines, etc., I can get. Uh, I've been looking at a few different bits and pieces uh, on my 
before we come on the show. Uh, and I'm confident that oil will be back around 70 by July and will be hanging, given that if the OPEC plus 11 uh, deal holds. So, so we'll be looking at that. And so that's going to increase the amount of exploration and production work that's going on in Russia. Well, that's never cut. Yeah. The whole point I'm trying to make is as these prices cre keep up, um, the business of oil and gas is going to benefit, it's going to prosper in oil and, in Russia uh, and, and globally as well. And in case this is the first time people have ever tuned in to you and I talking, what does Russman Info do? We provide news information and analysis on what's really going on from finding it to refining it. So if you're basically a company that's involved in uh, geophysical exploration uh, or you're involved in refining plants or you're a drilling company and you are not in the Russian market, which is the largest oil and gas market in the world outside of the USA, uh, you should be looking to make some money. Yeah, so next year, I, I think I, we agree that the Russian oil and gas market is going to grow. Um, if you're a company and you want to take advantage of that company anywhere in the world, um, you need some help. Rod has the information. He knows all the projects. He knows the project managers. He knows the budgets. He knows start dates, stop dates. So uh, reach out to him. Great guy. You can tell we have this great uh, uh, chemistry between us. He's like that when he does business. And if he can help you, he will. But it's one of the ways you can quickly get your company in Russia doing business to capitalize on this growth that's going to happen in the future. Thanks, Mark. That's correct. Yeah. And so uh, um, we're going to put the link to your website in the show notes so people can click on it. But what's your website again? www.rusminfo.com. Yeah. Um, tons of useful information. And if you're, this is the first time you've tuned in, you ought to go back and listen to some of our other episodes that we've done because there's a difference in what is really going on in the Russian business market, and that's what Rod and I talk about, versus what our media reports. And if you want to do business there, you need to know what's really going on, not what the media is reporting. Um, so, Rod, it's, um, what, it's late Friday after, evening for you, right? Friday night? It's uh, 8.25 in the evening, uh, yeah. which is why I'm enjoying a little vodka time. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, not quite time for me to, uh, to pour one. It's going to be a few hours away. But, you know, Russia is known for its vodka. Um, and one of the things I didn't know until just recently is you can make vodka from things other than potatoes. I always thought it was just made from potatoes. But it's actually, you can make it from any grain. Oh, yeah. You basically, uh, the local one here is made from the kurai flower. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> No, it's all right. I'll say to the, basically, it's a wild flower that is the emblem of Bashkiria, and it, they use it to make uh, the the vodka here. Uh, in fact, I just happen to have a bottle. Yeah, Zoto, which means gold. It's a pretty bottle. The frosted glass. Yeah, and not so expensive, but. Every region of Russia uh, has its own uh, dis vodka distilleries, and the the average supermarket of any reasonable size will have about 150 different vodkas. Holy sh! <laughs> That's a lot of vodka. Um, is there a difference in the way they taste between the regions, or is the difference in the quality regardless of the uh, region? Oh, the, the, the difference is in the taste, obviously, and the, obviously in the quality. The, the more expensive end, for example, this looks like a big, nice book, doesn't it? Yes. Until you open it up. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Uh, this is called Legends of the Kremlin. Yep. Can you read the, the label? Yes. So that's uh, comes in a very nice decanter style bottle. You know, it's interesting is the main labels in Russia, but if you look the ring around the neck, it's in English. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's because. Uh, this some of this stuff does get exported. Now, as we were talking about uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich. Oh, that's cool. Now, is is has has was that made before Putin became in office? No, it's no. it's a, they just decided that they were going to name a premium Russian vodka after it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously there are some vodkas that you are familiar with. I think this sells quite well in, uh, in America. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I've seen that quite often. 
Yeah, yeah. But I mean, for those people who are ecologically friendly, <laughs> ecological vodka. Now, what? What's the, what's the firewood on? It's filtered through charcoal. Okay, okay. Same so, way that uh, Jack Daniels does with their Tennessee whiskey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. similar thing. Now, here is another vodka from my local area, which has got uh, various herbs, etc. in it. So, if you have a bit of flu and you don't fancy some lemon zip, try some of this. <laughs> it's got, again, a very unusual bottle. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys get this one, uh, but it goes perfectly with the caviar. Caviar, I would guess so. And speaking of caviar, what country produces more caviar than anybody? Russia. Russia. Well, <laughs> probably Iran and Russia, because it's Caspian, so they both have a bigger share of the Caspian than anybody else. But if I'm not mistaken, Russia actually figured out I may be wrong, but if Russia actually figured out how to warm rivers and to actually farm sturgeon commercially yeah. for caviar, which yeah, yeah. is something nobody else has figured out how to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so that, that's kind of work. Yeah. Well, the thing I think is cool is they it's it makes fiscal sense to spend the energy to warm a river <laughs> during the winter so that you can grow these sturgeon so you can harvest the caviar. I mean, it can't be cheap to warm a river. Uh, no. Yeah. But I, I'm sitting here in uh, a polo shirt in my apartment, and my heating went on on October the 1st, and it will be switched off on April the 30th. Now, uh, it's minus 30 outside, right? I have the double glazed windows, etc., but I don't have a thermostat. So how does your heater keep it at the right temperature? It doesn't. If it gets too hot, I open the window. <laughs> You know where else they do that is Norway. And it, my first couple trips, nobody told me that. I was staying in a hotel, and we got, and I was actually sweating, which was silly because it was frozen outside. And eventually, somebody says, "No, you just open the window to regulate the temperatures." Like, I wish you would have told me that when I first flew into the country. Yeah, yeah it's basically uh, we have a communal heating system uh, that's switched on, which means that unlike in the UK or in parts of Western Europe, where they put huge green subsidies onto electricity bills, where in the UK, for example, people have to choose to either eat or heat. Right. Here, everybody is warm as toast in the winter. So what? what's the heating, what's, is it actually, is it hot water, is it steam? Uh, the radiators are filled with boiling hot water. I can dry yeah. a pair of denim jeans in 15 minutes straight from the washing machine on my radiators. So the city actually provides the hot water to the communal heating system then? Yep. Okay, and that's some efficiencies there because that's only heat and water in one place and then all you have to do is distribute it around. Yeah, yeah. I mean basically uh, my heating bills for a year in Russia are what my heating and electricity bills were for a month in England. <laughs> big difference. <laughs> yeah, very big difference. But again, uh, it's gas. They basically use the gas system uh, for the benefit of the people. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, Rush, Rod, we're um, getting close to our, our, our end time, looking at the clock here. Um, okay. any, anything else you want to uh, do before we get out of here? No, if we shut down, we'll have a quick chat after. Okay. All right, folks, so I hope this helped. We will see you next time.